So my name is Mark Jordan, and I'm a wildlife biologist here at Seattle University. And my research is in urban ecology and urban wildlife management. And we're looking at two things in particular in the natural areas in South and West Seattle. Uh, one thing we're doing is using non-invasive monitoring methods to observe different wildlife species and see which species are inhabiting the parks we're in. So we've got uh, camera traps as well as hare snares to capture animals that come to baited stations in a variety of different parks. And then what we can do is look at habitat conditions and conditions around each park, the size of the park, how close a park is to another park, and see if that has any relationship to which wildlife species we find in it. The other thing I'm doing related to that is we're collecting hair samples from all of the species that we capture at these stations and we're using the DNA in the hair to look at how related different animals are between different parks. And we're focusing on raccoons and opossums because they're relatively easy to catch. We have quite a few of them here in Seattle and they tend to move relatively well through urban landscapes. And so what I'm interested in is, are there particular barriers for even a relatively mobile species like these carnivores in, within South or West Seattle? And so we use the relationships between the genetic relationships between these individuals we capture, and we assume that if two individuals that are caught in two different parks are relatively similar to each other genetically, then there's a lot of movement back and forth. They're exchanging genes. If there is very little similarity between them, we assume there's not as much movement back and forth. And then we can start looking at the landscape to identify barriers on the landscape that might be obstructing movement of individuals. And so the, the bigger picture then is to really identify how connected ecologically are Seattle's parks to each other and what does that say about the the other parts of Seattle, the residential, the industrial areas of Seattle. How effective are they in allowing Seattle to function as a, a fully functioning ecosystem? So carnivores are a good indicator of, of the health of an ecosystem, and that's why we're studying them in particular. They tend to indicate if you have carnivores, then you know there's enough food for them to eat, and then the, the animals that they're eating also have enough food to survive on as well. So if you've lost the carnivores, that means there's not enough sort of nutrition, if you want to put it that way, at the base of a food chain coming in to support a healthy carnivore population. So having more larger carnivores around is a relatively good indicator that there, there's more function, there are more interactions within that particular ecosystem among different species. Part of the, the issue with sort of fragmented or disconnected ecosystems is you get a loss of species diversity. And we certainly see that if you compare Seattle's parks to say a park up in the, the Cascades, that you would find just fewer species overall, so lower biodiversity. And then you also lose some levels of ecosystem function as well in terms of um, sort of generating more nutrients for more species to live in as well as, um, well those, those I guess would be the main ones, at least associated with biodiversity. Part of the reason anybody should be concerned about levels of biodiversity in, in urban areas is that biodiversity has been shown to correlate with a lot of other benefits in terms of more biodiverse ecosystems capture more solar radiation and therefore if you wanted to say you know, plant crops within a, an ecosystem and we have a, a food forest on Beacon Hill that is an example of this where you can have a more diverse system that captures more um, primary productivity from the sun that leads to more outputs for humans. So that's one way. And they also tend to be more resilient to change. So if we want our parks to be sort of in a, a forested state in perpetuity, if they're really choked up and invaded by ivy and holly and some of the other invasive species we have, and there aren't very many species, they may essentially collapse uh, more easily and be less resistant to disturbance than if there are a lot of species there that can resist um, invasive species and other types of disturbances like that. So in the face of climate change, what we expect to see is possible changes in the types of species that you find in different parks. And in what I mean by different species, in this case, we would really be looking at plant species and how they would respond to a warmer, drier environment and also a different seasonal pattern in the, the precipitation they might obtain. So a more resilient system would be more able to withstand sort of a slow transition as new species that are better adapted to this environment move in as opposed to a more kind of abrupt change that you might, might anticipate in a less biodiverse system.
So for people to get involved in helping maintain healthier urban ecosystems, a couple things come to mind. One is the Green Seattle Partnership is an umbrella organization that helps coordinate volunteer efforts and restoration activities in Seattle's parks. And so they do a lot of work in removing ivy, planting native species, and really restoring a lot of these parks to a more natural state and pulling the, the invasive species that are really the primary issue with Seattle's natural areas, um, removing them from the system. And then we can go in and see, have the carnivores recovered in such a way? Do we see other types of carnivore species moving in that might be benefiting from that? In terms of connectivity, looking at what's going on between the parks, that's really much more individualized because it depends on a particular owner of a specific residential lot, for example. And so some areas that my research group is interested in looking at is what are the roles of things like zoning or street trees that affect connectivity? Do we find more connectivity with certain zoning types in between natural parks or areas? And that might affect the way people approach discussing um, planning issues with the planning department and their neighborhood councils. You also might see if there's a high correlation between the number of trees um, between two areas that are, have high connectivity, we can enhance street tree planting programs and those sorts of things that private individuals could get involved with. I say that the fact that SU is a Jesuit institution impacts my work because SU is very engaged with the community around it and that's part of its mission is being very involved within the city that shares its name. And my research is deliberately in Seattle for that very reason, that I want to work in the community where we all live. That it, I feel like it helps the students gain a better understanding of engagement with your local community if we're doing work specifically in the local community that we can get to on the bus. And, you know, I've, I've never had a, a field job before where I could commute to work on the bus, but this is, so that's pretty nice. When you think about environmental justice and the type of work I do, you Notice that a lot of the people who are most engaged in parks and natural areas are from a relatively narrow demographic group. They tend to be older, whiter, more affluent. But in the parts of the city where I'm working, particularly in southeast Seattle, we have communities from all over the world. And so there are a lot of people who simply are not as engaged with the, the communities and the parks right around them. And I think that one of the important environmental justice missions for people who are interested in urban park systems is to find ways to reach out and understand what diverse communities want out of their parks and natural areas. And related to that is that their kids, I feel like there's a lot of research around the importance of getting children engaged with nature, just in terms of enhancing environmental stewardship, as well as simply leading them down the right path or helping them you know, perform better in school because they've had time to run around outdoors. And our natural areas are an amazing asset, and Seattle has a, a great array of parks spread throughout the city. And if we can find ways to engage all of the communities who live in Seattle with caring for and stewarding for their parks, I think that that is going to be of benefit to the city as a whole. And so. That's where I see environmental justice overlapping with the type of work I do in the parks. So one thing that gives me pause when I think about humanity's relationship with the earth is that we have leaders who don't seem to be too engaged with environmental issues and seem to be really more engaged with bickering and infighting among themselves and than solving actual problems, which in a sense maintains the status quo, which at certain times might be helpful, but in the face of a number of environmental issues that we're facing, like climate change, like invasive species, we can't really sit by and wait. And so what gives me the biggest pause is watching our leaders essentially adopt a stance that results in sitting by and waiting. Uh, but what gives me hope is my students who are young and enthusiastic and idealistic, and, but they temper that idealism with a certain amount of realism that the students I work with tend to understand sort of the limits of, based on past mistakes of people of my generation and before, sort of the limits of what can be achieved, but have the idealism to still push for some sort of greater change. And what I hope is that by training them to be better stewards of the earth, that they can go out and be more kind of accomplished advocates for the types of issues that are really relevant and important to them.